Lecture 8 is on Hegel versus Kierkegaard on individuality. Modern philosophy has clear birth and death dates. 1637 marks its beginning with the publication of Descartes' Discourse on Method, and 1831 marks its end with Hegel's death. Modern philosophy begins with Descartes, who ignored all previous philosophy and built a new system, a closed and complete system, which was not just an ordered and outlined summary or summa of theology like Aquinas. This closed system building ended with Hegel, whose system is the most complete, so complete that it blows up like an overinflated balloon. Hegel was the last metaphysical system builder. Nearly every major philosophical development since Hegel began with the rejection of Hegel in many different directions. Marxism, atheistic existentialism, theistic existentialism, personalism, positivism, logical positivism, analytic philosophy, pragmatism, phenomenology, deconstructionism. We're no longer living in the era of modern philosophy. We are postmodern. That term, postmodern, is not very clear about what it affirms, but it is very clear about what it denies. It denies the Enlightenment project of building a complete rational system, as Hegel did. Hegel is a kind of negative touchstone, or a benchmark, or a turning point in philosophy, from the modern to the postmodern. Much as Aristotle was a touchstone and benchmark for ancient Greek philosophy, and as Aquinas was for medieval philosophy. After all three of these thinkers, philosophy became more skeptical and critical of itself and of reason itself. After the Hellenic Age, Hellenistic philosophy in late Greece and in Rome became much more modest and human and practical. Its two main schools were Epicureanism and Stoicism. Late medieval philosophy became increasingly skeptical because of nominalism, and the positive thinkers were mystics, not rational system builders. The same thing, in more diverse forms, happened after Hegel, after the balloon had popped. There is a remarkable parallelism between the most radical critic of the first great modern philosopher and the most radical critic of the last great modern philosopher, that is, between Pascal's critique of Descartes and Kierkegaard's critique of Hegel. We could label the issue common to both critiques existentialism versus rationalism, as long as we did not reduce what we meant by existentialism to irrationalism, and as long as we did not reduce what we meant by reason to calculating reason. Existentialists come in many different varieties, but all existentialists, both atheistic and theistic, focused on concrete individual human existence rather than on metaphysical essences as known by abstract reason. But to understand both Pascal and Kierkegaard, we also need to focus on a more concrete issue than the issue of reason. We need to focus on the issue that was the central issue for both Pascal and Kierkegaard, which was Jesus Christ himself. Very few establishment scholars of either Pascal or Kierkegaard today dare to do that. They either ignore or patronize that focus and that center. Thus, they radically misunderstand both of these two philosophers. They were existentialist Christians, not Christian existentialists. For both, Christ was not an adjective, but a noun. Pascal began by identifying the four most salient pieces of data for any philosophy to explain as the universal human longing for certainty, the universal longing for happiness, the universal failure to achieve certainty, and the universal failure to achieve happiness. Notice that these data are all concrete and human and practical. They're about human existence, not essences. Pascal's data was the Christ-shaped hole in the human heart, or the Christ-shaped keyhole in the door of human life. And Pascal then argued that Christ alone fully explained all four of these basic data, that Christ was the strangely shaped key, the only key that fit the strangely shaped lock in the door of the human life. Pascal also made the same central point in another way. He identified the four great questions of philosophy as the meaning of life, of death, of man, and of God, and asserted boldly that whoever knows Christ knows these four things, and whoever does not, does not. Kierkegaard's philosophy has the very same unfashionable center as Pascal's. 
In his last complete book, The Point of View for My Work as an Author, Kierkegaard tells us the strategy and purpose of all of his many and very varied works, and he says that the single point of everything he had ever written was becoming a Christian. Usually the connection is indirect, but it is always there. Christ is the end and center that unifies all that Kierkegaard ever wrote. Unsurprisingly, the book where he explains that is the one book that most Kierkegaard scholars most assiduously ignore, even though it is the most authoritative guide to Kierkegaard because it is the only one Kierkegaard himself gave us. It takes a very clever scholar to ignore an elephant in the middle of the living room. From Pascal's point of view, Descartes was both a Christian and a philosopher, but not a Christian philosopher. In Descartes' thought, Christianity and philosophy were separated as radically as the mind and the body, spirit and matter. From Kierkegaard's point of view, Hegel claimed to be a Christian, but he subverted Christianity by reducing it to a mythic primitive version of his own pantheistic philosophy, which was the higher truth. Both Descartes and Hegel exalted reason above faith, philosophy above theology, science above religion, and both were more concerned with perfecting the human secular temporal society than with the sanctification and salvation of eternal individual souls. And both Pascal and Kierkegaard thought this set of priorities was upside down. They were the two most centrally and completely Christian philosophers of modern times. I shall summarize Hegel first, then Kierkegaard's critique and alternative. Hegel emerges historically from Kant through his response to the central point of Kant's epistemology, namely what Kant called his Copernican revolution in philosophy, which was the redefining of truth as not the mind conforming to its object, which all previous philosophers had assumed, but the object conforming to the mind. All form and meaning and truth itself was imposed on the object by the subject, though this was not subjective in the sense that it was individual and free, but it was universal and necessary. This was Kant's attempt to answer Hume's skepticism, but it actually exacerbated that skepticism, since Hume at least allowed that we had probable knowledge of objective reality through our senses, while Kant denied that we could ever know any things in themselves or objective reality as it really is. We could know only the appearances that were structured by our own forms of knowing, both sensory, space and time, and logical, the basic categories of thought, and metaphysical, the ideas of God, self, and world, as what he called the ideas of pure reason. These three structures were necessary and universal, but they were subjective. They were from us, not from reality. All categories were our categories, not reality's categories. Now Hegel perceived that Kant's dualism between knowable phenomena and unknowable things in themselves was self-contradictory. If we could not ever know things in themselves, how could we know that such things existed at all? How could we know unknowables? As Wittgenstein later said, in order to draw a limit to thought, thought must think both sides of that limit. Think about that for a minute. Not only to think what X is, but also to think that X is, is to think X. Otherwise, we would not be thinking that X is, but that something else is. We can't think what we can't think. We can only think what we can think. So even Kant, Kant turned Kant into can. So Hegel simply dropped the distinction between thought and being, between reason and reality, between the rational and the real. And he famously said that the real is the rational and the rational is the real. That did not mean that he returned to common sense realism, but he departed from it even more seriously than Kant did. Kant at least believed in the distinction between reason and reality. He believed in the existence of objective reality, though he said we could not know it as it really was. Hegel denied the very existence of anything outside thought. Thus, he replaced Kant's so-called critical idealism, or ideaism, with what's called absolute idealism. Everything is idea for Hegel. 
Kant was radical because he reversed the causal relationship between thought and its object by his Copernican revolution, but Kant agreed that they were in a causal relationship, thus that there was still a distinction between the two. But Hegel collapsed Kant's dualism between thought and its object. For Hegel, everything is thought, or spirit, divine thought. Everything is a stage in the progress of God, or spirit, coming to know himself a stage in the process or inner evolution of divine thought, including all the things in the world and all human beings and all human thoughts. And Hegel made an elaborate map of the structures and stages of this divine thought, a map of everything. So for Hegel, everything is identified with God. God is identified with spirit, spirit is identified with thought, and thought is identified with reason. Even history, says Hegel, is a rational process. So Hegel is a rationalist pantheist. Pantheists claim that all is one, that everything is a part of God, or a form of God, or for Hegel, a stage of God's progress. But Hegel's God is not a distinct person like the God of the Bible. God is everything. So for Hegel, there are not two kinds of reality, the changing and the unchanging, but only one. All pantheists say that, but while other pantheists usually deny the reality of time and temporal reality, Hegel denies the reality of the timeless. Even God changes. Everything is a stage in God's progress. Everything evolves because God himself evolves, and God is everything. In fact, God is the very process of spirit evolving and progressing. This is historical relativism. Since everything changes, truth itself changes over time. Truth is historically relative. It is this historical relativism, not his pantheism or rationalism, that the modern world has taken over from Hegel. For instance, Marx picked up the idea of historical relativism from Hegel and taught that there were no universal standards transcendent to history itself to judge between capitalism and communism. And thus, every concept and term in one system means something radically different from what it means in the other system. All standards of judgment are historically, socially, and politically relative. Nothing is timeless. For Hegel, this lack of timeless universal standards means that there is no universal and unchangeable justice or natural moral law to judge between nations. So Hegel concludes that war is the only possible referee and authority between nations. So each nation state is the supreme authority with no universal timeless standard outside of them or above them to judge them or to judge between them. This is an implicit political totalitarianism. And it is one of the themes in Hegel that Kierkegaard most passionately opposes with his typically existentialist emphasis on the free individual. Hegel actually identified the state with the kingdom of God on earth. Hegel thus is really undoing the moral revolution of the ancient Jewish prophets who introduced into human history an absolute standard above kings or tyrants or even emperors and empires, and that could judge them. Kierkegaard not only argued against Hegel, he satirized him. He wrote that Hegel was a genius and he might have been seen as the greatest thinker of all time if only he had added a single sentence to his works. But the lack of that sentence made him a buffoon. The sentence is, everything I have ever written is an elaborate joke. The joke for Kierkegaard is that Hegel's philosophy is like a great castle without doors. Human beings cannot enter it or live in it. It is like a book that claims to be the secret of God's own inner life, but it has human fingerprints on it. It's a book that claims to explain everything, but it leaves one crucial thing out, the existence of the author himself, the actual individual who writes the system. In reaction to Hegel and to an era that he saw as increasingly collectivistic and self-forgetting, Kierkegaard designed his own tombstone to read simply the individual. Ironically, the name Kierkegaard means churchyard or graveyard. Kierkegaard saw the loss of individuality, of honest self-consciousness, of the inner life and personal responsibility, not only in Hegel's philosophy, but in the whole modern world around him, which was substituting groupthink for I-think. 
it tried to read the zeitgeist, the spirit of the times, but it ended up reading the times instead of the eternities. Kierkegaard's own philosophy asks not how thought or spirit or God progresses through stages, as Hegel does, but how an individual human being progresses through life. And how is that? Here, surprisingly, Hegel and his two most important critics, Kierkegaard and Marx, agree concerning the logical form or structure of change, though not about the content. The essential structure or form of all historical change, and also of all human thought for Hegel, is dialectical, which means for him a kind of three-step waltz, beginning with a thesis, which then generates its own antithesis or opposite, and then move to a higher synthesis, which is not a compromise or a blending, but a progress to a higher, more comprehensive and inclusive level. Marx applied that dialectic to history, with communism as the final stage. For Marx, history moved not by spirit, but by matter. Marx was a materialist, and ultimately by money and economics. Thus, Marx is a dialectical materialist, whereas Hegel was a dialectical spiritualist. The content couldn't possibly be more different, but the form was the same. Kierkegaard too, Hegel's other great opponent, changed the content but kept the form. Kierkegaard's dialectic is not about the stages of universal history or of the pantheistic progress of God or spirit or reason, but about three very different modes of human existence, three different ways an individual can live which Kierkegaard calls the three stages on life's way. They are the stages of spiritual growth, the stages of self-discovery or self-maturing, the aesthetic or self-indulgent hedonism, a kind of original sin that we're born into, and then the ethical, which is an essentially Kantian view of universal law and moral duty, and finally the religious, which is essentially a personal relationship with the God of the Bible. The essential categories of good versus evil in the aesthetic stage are the interesting versus the boring. Even pleasure gets boring. It does not fulfill our desire, so we seek diversions and distractions, as Pascal said, including wars. The essential categories of good versus evil in the ethical stage are obedience versus disobedience to moral law. Law conceived as universal and rational, as in Kant. Finally, the essential categories of good versus evil in the religious stage are faith versus sin, fidelity versus infidelity to God, spiritual marriage versus spiritual divorce. For Kierkegaard, the aesthetic stage does not necessarily mean a devotion to beauty or art or sense experience, which is the literal meaning of the Greek word from which the word aesthetic comes. It could be intellectually aesthetic, like Hegel's philosophy which is a game of concepts. Hegel is a sophisticated intellectual esthete. He is a genius stuck in kindergarten. And the progress of the individual up Kierkegaard's three stages is not predetermined and predestined, as progress is for humanity in general in both Hegel and Marx. Rather, for Kierkegaard, this progress is freely chosen. Both Hegel and Marx deal with humanity in general, not with the individual. That's why both deny free choice and free will. In the three-stage dialectic of Hegel, the third stage, the higher synthesis, not only unites the thesis and the antithesis, but perfects them both. And this is true in Kierkegaard too. The aesthetic stage, which has the minus of seeking only pleasure and the relief of boredom, has at least the plus of being concrete and individual and personal and passionate unlike the ethical stage, which is abstract and universal and impersonal and rational. But although the ethical has the plus of being unselfish and morally responsible, while the aesthetic stage is selfish and irresponsible, yet it has the minus of being abstract and impersonal, while the aesthetic is concrete and personal. So the religious stage is a higher synthesis of both the other two, because it's concrete and individual, like the aesthetic, and at the same time responsible and unselfish and moral, like the ethical. The aesthetic is creative but unfaithful. The ethical is faithful but uncreative. And the religious is both creative and faithful. It is what Marcel called creative fidelity. 
it is even more self-transcending and self-forgetful than the ethical. And it is also even more passionate and individual than the aesthetic. For it is an infinite passion, a passion for eternal life. But its passion is inward and invisible, and its outer appearances are humble and ordinary. The supreme drama of human life is an invisible inner drama. Kierkegaard calls this ordinary religious person a knight of faith. Faith is a drama far more dramatic than anything else, and the hero of faith is more heroic than the knights of King Arthur's Round Table. The three stages are a very useful device for defining basic options in life and classifying both real and fictional people as to which stage they have attained. Kierkegaard would probably classify the Sophists, Bacon, Hegel, and probably Descartes as aesthetic, Buddha, Confucius, Kant, Aristotle, and Socrates as ethical, although Socrates was also religious, he was a pious agnostic, and certainly Augustine and Pascal and the saints and all repentant sinners as religious. The three stages are not just three different goals that any self can choose and live. They are three different meanings of the very term self. The esthete subordinates everything and anyone around him to his own happiness, which of course also ends in despair. The ethical person subordinates his own will and even his own happiness to the impersonal, universal, and absolute moral law. And the religious person surrenders neither to his individual desires nor to universal law, but to God. He surrenders his mind in faith and his will in love and his desire in hope, and he finds resurrection through this death, finds his self by losing his self. Kierkegaard is a psychological master at describing these three stages in concrete detail, especially in Either Or, which is about the aesthetic versus the ethical, and in Fear and Trembling, which is about the ethical versus the religious. Both of these books read much more like a novel than like a philosophical argument. Either Or is a series of fictional letters between a brilliant but dissolute young playboy, Don Juan the Seducer, and Judge William, a middle-aged moralist, who sees the inner emptiness of the esthete. Fear and Trembling is about Abraham's agonizing choice between the ethical absolute, which says thou shalt not murder, and the religious absolute, the God, who commands him to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. Both books are about choice, not the choice between two things, but between two or rather three kinds of choices, the aesthetic choice between the interesting and the boring, or the selfish and the unselfish, the ethical choice between obeying and disobeying the moral law, and the religious choice between faith and sin. Kierkegaard also describes the uncertainty of someone who is stuck between the stages in the concept of dread, which is about angst, a kind of anxiety which is anonymous and universal, and also in the sickness unto death, which is about despair and also in Philosophical Fragments, which is, I think, the profoundest comparison I know between the two most important persons who ever lived, Socrates and Jesus, and their different concepts of truth. Although these are not Kierkegaard's terms, we could say that for the aesthetic person, truth is subjective, for the ethical person, truth is objective, and for the religious person, truth is relational. Kierkegaard actually says that in the religious stage, truth is subjectivity, but this refers to the passion of the faith of the individual believer in relation to God. Truth for the Christian is Christ himself who said, I am the truth. The Hebrew word for truth, emeth, really means truthfulness. It is a property of a person, not first of all a proposition. Kierkegaard's point is the same one that C.S. Lewis made in The Last Battle with the pagan saint whom Lewis deliberately named Emeth. Kierkegaard put the point this way. If one who lives in the midst of Christendom and goes up to the house of God, the house of the true God, with a true concept of God in his knowledge, and prays, but prays in a false spirit, and one who lives in an idolatrous community, prays with the entire passion of the infinite, although his eyes rest on the image of an idol, where is there the most truth? The pagan prays in fact to God, though he worships an idol. The Christian prays falsely to the true God, and hence in fact worships an idol.
Socrates and Jesus are Kierkegaard's two greatest heroes. And as we shall see in the next lecture, they were Nietzsche's two greatest villains. Both Kierkegaard and Nietzsche saw Western civilization as a planet orbiting around this double star for 2,000 years and now detaching itself from both and becoming either something more than human, which is Nietzsche's Superman, or something less than human, which is Kierkegaard's prophecy, very much like that of C.S. Lewis in The Abolition of Man and of Aldous Huxley in Brave New World. Kierkegaard saw himself as a kind of Christian Socrates, making things harder in a world that was trying to make things easier. Here is a delightful quotation that tells us the origin of his philosophical vocation. Kierkegaard is sitting in a park in Copenhagen, musing. He writes, So there I sat and smoked my cigar until I lapsed into reverie. Among other thoughts, I remember this. You are now, I said to myself, on the way to becoming an old man without being anything and without really undertaking to do anything. On the other hand, wherever you look around you, in literature and in life, you see the celebrated names and figures, the precious and most heralded men who are the benefactors of the age, who know how to benefit mankind by making life easier and easier, some by railways, others by omnibuses and steamboats, others by the telegraph, others by easily apprehended compendiums and short recitals of everything worth knowing. And finally, the true benefactors of the age who make spiritual existence easier and easier and yet more and more significant. And what are you doing? Here my self-communication was interrupted for my cigar had burned out and a new one had to be lit. Between those two cigars, Kierkegaard's vocation was born. So I smoked again, and then suddenly there flashed through my mind the thought, you must do something, but inasmuch as with your limited capacities it will be impossible to make anything easier than it has become, you must, with the same humanitarian enthusiasm as the others, undertake to make something harder. This notion pleased me immensely, and at the same time it flattered me to think that I, like the rest of them, would be loved and esteemed by the whole community. Just like Socrates, of course. For when all combine in every way to make everything easier and easier, there remains only one possible danger, that one want is left, although not a felt want, that people will want difficulty. Out of love for mankind, therefore, I conceived my task to create difficulties everywhere. The one thing that Kierkegaard wanted to make harder above all was Christianity. Not that he wanted to change it into something harder than it is, but that he believed his culture had changed it into something easier than it is, easier than Christ made it. And he saw Hegel as part of this taming of the tiger in at least four ways, through his historical relativism, through his reducing Christianity to a myth for the masses, through his pantheism, which reduced God to everything and the church to here comes everybody, and through his dialectic, which avoids all hard choices, all either ors, and substitutes a higher synthesis for every antithesis. But that is not how Christianity has thrived. Throughout history and throughout the nations of the world, wherever Christianity thrives the most is where it is persecuted, where it is hard and costly. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, as Tertullian said. And wherever Christianity is established and made easy and comfortable, wherever it is the default position, it always decays and declines. And today it is declining rapidly in both numbers and powers both in quantity and quality, in almost all places and all nations where it used to be established, that is, in Christendom, or Western civilization, especially where it was established most securely. For instance, Quebec, Holland, Ireland, France, Italy, Germany, England, Spain. But it is growing remarkably in both quality and quantity, in passionate commitment and in numbers, almost everywhere where it is hard and poor and persecuted and terrorized, in Islamic countries, in China, and most of all in Africa. Kierkegaard was a prophet who saw this process and saw his vocation as a spy smuggling Christianity back into so-called Christian society or Christendom. 
Kierkegaard wrote almost 200 years ago, but nothing is more up-to-date and relevant to our needs than that vocation. His attack upon Christendom is the answer to the question that puzzles all Christians today. How can the church reclaim the world and win the culture war? Kierkegaard's answer to that question, which so many Christians are asking today, is nothing more and nothing less than the answer of the New Testament. And smuggling New Testament Christianity into Christendom was Kierkegaard's lifelong vocation. It is exactly what St. Pope John Paul II called the new evangelization. Kierkegaard describes it as an undertaking which means neither more nor less than proposing to reintroduce Christianity into Christendom. I am not for a Christian severity as opposed to a Christian leniency. I am neither for leniency nor for severity. I am for a human honesty. The leniency, which is the common Christianity in the land, I want to place alongside the New Testament to see how these two are related to one another. Then, if it appears, if it can be maintained face to face with the New Testament, with the greatest joy will I agree to it. But one thing I will not do, not for anything in the world, I will not, by suppression or by performing tricks, try to produce the impression that the ordinary Christianity in the land and the Christianity of the New Testament are alike. At Kierkegaard's funeral, one of his admirers interrupted the service by reading Revelation 3, verses 14 through 22. Look it up. It is the only place in the Bible where God threatens to vomit. <laughs>